hard it was to uh, not pick Isaiah 40 as a text for today. Um, we used it as the benediction last week. If you remember, those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They'll rise up on the wings like eagles. And it was really, really hard uh, not to do that. But I figured most of the people that cared about that sort of thing wouldn't be sitting in here today anyway. So um, I'm really glad you're here. And we're doing this. But, uh, and I appreciate the radio silence about the football game that may or may not be going on right now. Um, my phone was turned off, and so... I'll turn it back on at 9 o'clock tonight after I watch it. So, um, but Jesus loves us, and whether or not you had a football game to watch tonight, he still loves you too. So that's good news. Uh, would you guys pray with me? And we'll jump into Mark tonight. Jesus, thank you so much for another night that we have to gather in your presence as your people. That whether we uh, come in weary and wounded, uh, God literally sick, our bodies not working the way they ought to be, or our hearts weary, uh, that this is a space that you invite us into uh, good news, uh, to remind our very souls, the deepest part of us, that you are alive, you are active, you are working, you are present. You have not overlooked any single person in this room, but in love you move towards us. And so tonight as we talk, would you make us aware of some of the ways that uh, we can respond to your grace by moving back towards you? Spirit, you're the breath of the living God. Would you uh, breathe new life and joy, uh, maybe the faintest whispers even of hope again? Uh, God, would you heal? Uh, would this be space as your kids gather where your spirit has free reign because you are welcome here? Uh, we love you and we're grateful. I ask this in Jesus' name and by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So, uh, two, we two years ago for our anniversary, Kay and I decided that we would go uh, pack rafting down the Salt River. So, pack rafting is an inflatable raft, not the full on whitewater rafting that you might get at the Grand Canyon, also, not the hardbound kayak. And so, uh, Michael and Noel graciously volunteered to watch the platoon at home. And so, they were playing games and doing arts and crafts and all that fun stuff. And Kaylee Ann and I decided to go uh, down the Salt River and get in a pack raft. So, we got to the side of the river. We inflated the raft. We put on uh, life jackets because safety first, right? Even though you can walk out of almost every part of the Salt River, if you hit your head, you might not be able to. And so you wear a life jacket, kids. Uh, and we also put on headlamps because not just for the first time going down the Salt River in a pack raft during the daytime, that would be what normal people do. We decided we would do it at night because it was supposed to be a full moon and there should be plenty of light. Uh, we brought some headlamps to supplement the light. So we did all that, jumped in, and for the sake of this particular story, I'll just get to the one point. We're about a third of the way on the trip, and the headwinds are so strong coming down the river that we're paddling backwards. Like, this isn't an exaggeration. We would paddle and then move backwards. And then we'd paddle again, and then we'd move backwards. And so uh, if you ever want to do marriage therapy, just get in a canoe or a kayak uh, with your significant other, and you will learn very quickly that you are not as in tune as you thought you were, um, not just paddling, but maybe also your emotions. And so uh, we're getting frustrated just a little bit, uh, paddling a third of the way, like, man, all right, what if we turned around and went back? You're a third of the way down, right? But your brain's not thinking logically necessarily at this particular point because we're, we're getting blown the opposite direction we're paddling, and that's super frustrating. And so uh, we actually, in a moment of just that frustration, said, all right, well, how bad can it be? Let's see if that works. And so we turned the little pack raft around in the river and started paddling back up the river against the current as if that would be better uh, than going with the current just against the headwind. Uh, it, in fact, is not a better choice. Um, and the current is actually stronger than even the wind is. And so it felt like this desperate, frustrated moment of, uh, well, we can't stop, we can't keep going, how long would it take for us to get out of the river and then hike back to one of the two of our cars? How cool are Michael and Noel with sleeping over our house tonight because we can't get back? All those thoughts going through our brains. Um, and then you take a deep breath. You re-center yourself and you remember that 
wins don't last forever. You can continue doing the same sort of practices that got you this far down the river. There might be some resistance for a little while, but that will probably be your best bet to be carried on into the future. And so uh, by God's grace and the weather patterns, both of which intertwined, uh, after a little bit that wind relented, and by the <laughs> light on our headlamps, because the moon was in fact not as bright as it should have been, uh, we went down the rest of the river, were able to return. Michael and Noel did not have to spend the night with the kids, and we all made it back safely, which was just beautiful. Um, but, great story. What's the point of that? The practices and patterns of our lives shape the direction we go. The patterns and practices of our lives will shape the trajectory of our life. If you were listening last week, Jesus' question of what does it benefit you to gain the whole world and lose your soul, uh, if you found yourself recognizing there's some pockets of my soul, of my heart, of my life that are evidencing unhealth, uh, whether it's my response to conflict or it's my uh, buying patterns or my TV watching patterns or the things that I'm doing in my free time or the way my mind is drifting or the distance I feel in some of my relationships, all of those different things showing off. Maybe there's a check engine light in your heart that's, that's popping off and you should pay attention. Uh, this week, we want to talk about some of the practices that, yes, may not be new to you, but somehow in the face of a headwind in life, we try going to other things or want to quit, find ourselves in a mess, spinning in circles much like our raft was. And the hope for tonight is to remind ourselves as a little community of disciples and disciple makers uh, what it looks like for us to have patterns that will push us through those moments. Uh, not out of obligation or duty or empty religion. That's not what we're talking about. But we will all be doing something when we hit those headwinds in life. We will all be doing something when we notice there is unhealth. We will all choose to respond in one way or another. And the hope is that in consistent, Jesus-focused, gospel-informed ways, we put our paddles in the water of discipleship and paddle and stroke after stroke after stroke follow Jesus in the direction he's taking us. And the hope would be a community that was able to do that. And so we're going to look at a few different practices from the book of Mark and through some of the Gospels. A lot of you are reading along with us. If you want to get a head start, Mark 1 is the first text we'll turn to. Uh, Mark 1 will be where we start off and then launch out from. But the reason that we're spending some time here is because our days are made up of moments, our moments are made up of seconds, and you combine all that together and that's what makes up our life. And the invitation for followers of Jesus are to have those things shaped in healthy ways by the good news of Jesus. And that's what we want. Uh, one last story and we'll jump in. If you go to my house, you'll go in the backyard and you'll notice a few things. Uh, first thing, first things first, you will notice that it was not a great winter grass year for the Platts. Um, just walk in the backyard, you'll be like, this wasn't your year, Kevin. Um, you've had good years. There's been ones where it's brilliant. Uh, this is not that year. And what you'll also notice is if you look to the left, uh, that grass looks decidedly drier than the stuff that's on the right. On the left-hand side, we forget to water the grass all the time. Our house was built before uh, sprinklers were installed in homes, and it is not along the canal path for flood irrigation, so it takes somebody turning the water on and off to water it. And this season, it just hasn't been the grass's turn to live. Uh, and so that doesn't work. But if you look on the right-hand side, going out the back over to the right, that will be the side that uh, our kids have forgotten more than once to turn off the water uh, when it was watering one of the fruit trees over there. And that water overflows into the grass. And that grass that you don't normally see, because it's over around the corner, is really green. Uh, the major difference, you could say, like there's soil differences, there's a difference in the sunshine. It's the easy answer. One's getting watered and one's not. And that's made all the difference in what grows. Uh, when we look at our lives and the patterns and the habits and the decisions we're making, I would just give us that very simple truth. Sometimes there's complexity in our heart that's keeping us from following Jesus. Sometimes it's just a matter of whatever you water in your life will be what grows. And so whatever you're giving your time and your attention and your affection and your imagination to 
could very well be what is flourishing in your life. And if you don't see that being your relationship with Jesus, I would just encourage you, leave the water on there a little bit longer and see what grows out of that. Um, that's my really short version. So tonight we're gonna look at a few different practices and these are all um, just different things that I've been noticing as I'm reading through the gospels with you. And so you can take a rele relaxed posture for this one. You don't have to uh, wonder what the next big jumping out moment is. If I stand up, that's probably when I'll get loud. Otherwise you'll hear it a little bit more conversational because I, I want us to uh, move into these things in a space of awareness and being able to process and think through, all right, what from tonight can I immediately integrate into my life? Uh, if there's practices that you hear of and you're like, oh, I already do all those, I already got all that, I would encourage you engage with those same rhythms, maybe in a little bit different way. Uh, intentional pattern disruption will breed a ton of growth, both intellectually and emotionally in your heart. Like if you break the patterns that you always do, you'll learn new stuff about yourself and you'll learn incredible, probably new things about Jesus and his community. And so break that up a little bit would be my encouragement. Um, the very first piece, Mark 1 and verse 14. Uh, this one shouldn't surprise you, but we start here. Uh, make it a regular practice. If we want to be resilient disciples who last in the, the pursuit of following Jesus and leading others to do the same, then the very first thing we need to make a practice of is remembering the gospel. Mark 1, 14, it says, And after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news. That's the word gospel of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. In Mark's account of the gospel, which reads at a fast pace, almost graphic novel speed for the gospels, recounting the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, uh, when he tells his story, he wants to start people at this. Remember that this radical statement by Jesus, right, this dynamic declaration that the kingdom of God was breaking into human history and everything would be forever changed was taking place. He's writing it after these events take place. So as he's penning it down for the church, he's saying, where do I want to start this story? He skips the whole entire part about Jesus being born. Do you notice that? Like when you read Mark's account, if you've been tracking, there's no wise men, there's no Mary, there's no shepherds, there's no this exodus to have to go to Egypt and come back. He drops in on John the baptizer, says Jesus gets baptized. That's 30 years into his life. And then he says, hey, here's what he was announcing. Good news best news possible. The kingdom of God is here. In moments when we feel like that headwind of life or of culture or of our, of our own brokenness are coming in towards us, rather than giving up and turning the other way, I would encourage us so strongly to remember the gospel that you know to be true. Good news, the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus changed everything. The world is decidedly different because the gospel is true. Uh, we talk about it often, but the gospel isn't just a set of advice column points. It's not just ideas or information, but good news is based in real facts that have taken place. Jesus really did live. He really did die. He really did resurrect. He really did bring new creation in now. And that has to change the way that we look at everything. At some different pockets of my life, that's been uh, what has anchored me when I have had those moments of wanting to be like, maybe I just walk away. Maybe this is too hard. God, maybe you've disappointed me for the umpteenth time and I don't feel like you're reading your lines like you should off of the script that I gave you. I remember being in the hospital when my dad was dying uh, on life support and he was in the other room. And that moment of what God was doing in me wasn't to bypass that all to say like, hey, Jesus is good, God is good, uh, keep going, Kevin, and uh, it'll all be worth it someday. What was going through my mind, and I can still remember because I would always wait for that, that door to open to go back to the surgery side of it and wonder if they were coming out with bad news or good news was that I remember at that point, some 13 years ago, whatever it's been, working through all the ways that God had been faithful so far in the story. 
to remember the gospel, the good news, the way that in the story of God, even in the moments when it seemed most out of control, God was absolutely good. He was absolutely in control. And that still stayed true to this day. And that wasn't a way to not feel the pain. I still felt it. But it was a way for me to have an anchor in the midst of that, that it's like, no, remember all this to be true, even though those beeping going on in this hospital room would lend you to believe it's not true. And so it's these big moments. There's a solidifying factor in remembering the good news of the gospel. And then even this week, uh, on Monday, I was a part of a training that Brittany did. Uh, at the well and she had some different leaders from across different churches or different organizations come together to teach us how the true story and a trauma-informed response to human development or yeah development is a way of uh, looking at the two things together that the bible and science aren't opposed but they actually form into a healthy discipleship model where they come together and that was the big idea that's what i walked away with you can tell if that's what you're aiming at that's what i walked away with uh teaching moment nope that wasn't the point at all My point is, in the first few minutes of that session, Brittany told the story of God. And we were about to get all kinds of bad news. Like, this is how messed up and broken and uh, distorted we can be as we respond to wounds in this world and things that happen to us and the way our brains and our bodies don't work the way they are supposed to anymore and they disassociate and all these big words. But she started it by telling the incredibly good news of Jesus who created And yes, human beings rebelled, but God is a faithful promise keeper. He sent Jesus who is gonna unify all things. And as she told this story, it was brilliantly done. And I found my heart had the anchor it needed to hear all of the wounds that we were about to discuss because I'd just been reminded, hey, this is who Jesus is. And this is where the story ends. One day, these wounds are really healed. One day, tears are wiped away. And in the meantime, we stay faithful to being present as the hands and feet of Jesus in whatever way we can. But it wasn't just advice she was offering up. When she told that, I found something in my own heart was responding to that in this little thing called worship, which again gave me the confidence not just to go through that day, but to hit the next day when we got bad news about another situation. And what I had heard the day before rooted me in a fresh way towards that. And so if we want to be men and women and students who are anchored in the story of God, we have to remember those good news events. And some simple ways to do that is I would just encourage you to start simple. Make it a practice to tell the story of God once a week for the rest of the year. That's like 46 more times you tell the story and re-anchor yourself in that good news. Uh, Make it a point to be around people who tell you good news, not just who offer you good advice. Uh, It's also good to get good advice, but we really also need good news spoken into our life. Remember this. Rehearse it. Uh, Find your heart welling up with worship in a response to who God is and what he's done. Mark starts his gospel off that way to remind them good news. Because the reality is sometimes we forget that news. Not that you're not a Christian or not that you're not saved. Those aren't the categories I'm talking through. But sometimes we actually forget just how good the good news of Jesus is because we get used to it. And then you talk to somebody who has no idea what you're talking about. And you're like, oh, like you're not even aware of how Jesus would change your life. And that's walking down the street every day alongside of you. That's working with you every day. That's in your schools. Like, Not everybody thinks that's really good news, in case you didn't know. Uh, If you just spend time in this bubble, you might think everybody thinks that. Uh, You guys don't do that. You have regular jobs. You spend time with other people. You're in sports and doing different things along other humans. Not everybody believes that. But we can also forget it. I flew in from L.A. on a Wednesday night, right before our missional community got together. And so as we were coming in, we came across the, uh, just the, our sweeping pathway was around Camelback. And that picture at the top uh, was the no-filtered version of the sunset coming through and around Camelback. And I had a window seat because that's how I roll. Um, and I picked the window seat. And so I'm in control of whether or not that light's open and shining on me or not. And I get to see beautiful things. But there was this reminder just coming in like, oh, this place is really beautiful. Like Jesus is uh, putting on a light show here tonight and Camelback 
it's just perfectly situated right there against that to give that silhouette. And there was a reminder just how beautiful of a space we live in that I drive by a few times a week and don't have that same response. The hope would be when we come back around the gospel that the same sort of thing happens to us, that we're amazed and mesmerized once again, the spirit helping us to see not just a sunset, but the God who paints the sunset, right? The one who picked the color palette, the one who put the mountains there, the one who has the sky light up in such a way that it reflects, reflects light, that it looks like that. Like the color scheme is just beautiful. And it's like, yeah, that same God wants to walk with you and made that possible. That's pretty epic. Uh, another practice, and this one, I'll move faster. That was my big one, because that's the one that here's what's true, and here's some of what we can do. Uh, if you track along in the Gospels, walking with Jesus is a necessary practice. Uh, if you want to be faithful for the long haul, if you want to be resilient, if you want to be able to continue following Jesus, uh, not just for one week, two week, one year, two year, but through life, I would highly encourage us to respond to the good news of Jesus by following Jesus, by walking with him. And so first, figuratively, uh, I, I grew up in a church setting and people used to always ask, how's your walk going? And I thought that was the dumbest thing. Uh, we'd be like, how's your walk going? It's like, faster than yours. And then it was a race, right? Like, or how's your walk going? And I would try to find as a kid some really smart, alecky, alecky answer for that one. Uh, and so I would be that kid that tried to come up with something like, that's a dumb question. But recognizing that the journey of following Jesus is so well described as a walk. Uh, when you see the disciples in the moments when they're healthy, they're either right alongside Jesus walking with him or they're a step behind him. You never see them in a healthy place when they're out in front of him. And so for us as apprentices, recognizing that we follow the pattern and pathway of Jesus, and so are our lives actually following him? There's a discipleship question woven throughout Mark that gets to some of the core of that. That is, is your desire genuinely to follow Jesus? And in Mark, he does it brilliantly. Uh, Mark 10, if you wanted to make a note, he talks to a few different people in that passage. Uh, Mark 10 is one where you see him talk to the rich young ruler. And so there's this question, right, the rich young ruler, this guy comes up to Jesus and he says, uh, hey, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And that's the guy that Jesus tells me to sell everything and then come and follow him. And that guy goes, yeah, not for me. And he goes away sad. Really short version of that. And he says, that's not what I want. I kind of wanted just how to get eternal life. I didn't want you to mess with my life right now. And whether it was because he liked the comfort of his money or he liked the control that he had of his world, whether it was I get viewed as a success and I give you all my stuff, I don't have success. Uh, whatever that was, he walks away sad. And then there's a second snapshot where Jesus uh, is talking to his disciples, James and John, and they're arguing and bickering, right? And he's like, it's like having kids. Uh, Jesus' discipleship journey with his Apprentices is a lot like having kids. And they're just arguing over there. And he goes over to me. He's like, what do you guys want? And they're like, all right, here's the question. When you get to glory, can one of us go on your right-hand side and one of us go on your left-hand side? Hey, Jesus, when you get to glory, can we be in the positions of power alongside of you? And Jesus uh, tells them, you guys, you guys don't have what it takes to walk what I'm about to walk. Like, you can't drink from the cup I drink of. Uh, you can't follow in the pathway. You don't have anything to do with this death I'm about to go through. And he teaches them a lesson saying, like, hey, in my kingdom, actually, it's the last who are first. And if you want to be great, then you should be a servant. Because I came to serve and to, not to be served. And he gives them that lesson, right? And so, and they continue on the journey kind of following Jesus, but there's not a real profound aha moment for him. You just kind of get the idea, Jesus says it and it settles with him. And then the last story in that same exact chapter, uh, there's a blind man on the side of the road uh, crying out, son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. And the crowd is like yelling at the dude, shut up, like be quiet. We've heard enough. He doesn't care, zip it whichever framework you use. And it says he just started screaming out louder, son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. To which Jesus responds and says, hey, send that guy over here. And so that guy comes and he's right next to Jesus. And Jesus asks him, what do you want for me to do for you? And that guy answers, I want to be healed. And Jesus tells him, your faith has made you well. And that guy immediately follows Jesus. 
In that snapshot, we see uh, first the rich young ruler who isn't even named, even though in that society, he would have had the most prestige, the most power. Uh, He didn't want anything to do with Jesus because he just wanted him to worry about his afterlife, not his right now life. And he goes away sad. The second story we hear about with James and John, their apprenticeship is going to take a little while longer. Uh, They don't quite get it later on. They absolutely do. But they're still in the process. But this blind dude, we get his name. It's Bartimaeus. Uh, Much unlike the rich young ruler that nobody knows, even though he was the prestigious one. You know the blind beggar from the side of the road in this little podunk town of Jericho who cried out, have mercy on me. And his first response at being healed isn't just sweet. I needed my legs. I needed my eyes. You gave them back. We're good to go. And he's off. But he follows and uses that to walk right after Jesus, showing it wasn't just about give me my miracle. It was let me follow you. And so the invitation and the practice for us that we have to reflect on, do we actually want Jesus or do we just want a display of power? Uh, Would we just like him to fix a few things in our life but leave the rest alone? Because when you walk with Jesus, he changes you. And what I've seen is some people that start in the life of following Jesus actually don't want him to heal all the parts of their life. They just wanted a little fix it, then leave the rest alone. And Jesus loves us too much for that. But if we want to follow him, there is such a beautiful picture of walking slowly with him. And so a practice I would give us to to put that into effect is not just uh, figuratively to walk with Jesus, but to literally walk with Jesus. Uh, There is something profoundly formative about these men walking along at whatever that is, Three miles an hour is the average pace, I think, for humans. And so uh, different people have postured that the speed of discipleship is three miles an hour. That as we walk and talk with Jesus along the way, he shapes us. And I would strongly encourage you in your formative practices, uh, many of you have already given this advice to, is to put your phone away and regularly go for walks with Jesus. See where your mind goes as you pray to him and follow him along that. Uh, not talking to another person or on the phone or checking different things, but in the quiet of a walk, left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot. The beauty of how Jesus even wired our bodies is that as we do left, right, it actually it causes us to settle and to center, which is just beautiful. And so they have this rhythm. I would encourage you, actually walk with Jesus. Set a time that's regular to be in a space with him as if he was speaking back, not just this idea that we loft out there that might shape our lives. Walk with Jesus. There's an invitation for it. And then the last few uh, are rhythms that you might have seen before. The blessed rhythms that we've talked about. uh, Bless, listen, eat, speak, and Sabbath. And so each of these can be done with our neighbors in a missional way. Each of these can be done with our missional communities in a communal way. Uh, If I would just love us tonight to think about how do we do these in a personal way. Uh, These are rhythms that are found from creation all the way through to new creation. They're not something we made up. So whether you're here in Phoenix or you go and find your home in Western Europe or you go to Australia or you're in uh, Alabama or if you're in Mexico, these same rhythms will be present there and able to be lived out. The context might look a little different. Like if Kenzie lives them out, it will look slightly different than Ken does. Uh, But both of them are absolutely able to live out these rhythms, and they're things that lead to life as we pursue Jesus. And so the first one, bless. Uh, When we bless God, this one's a little bit different uh, than how we bless our neighbors, which is often in word or gift giving something to someone or being a blessing to them that way. Uh, When the Bible speaks about blessing God, it means declaring the excellencies of. The Hebrew uh, word for bless is this idea, and it comes from the word knees. And the idea is that on your knees, you're declaring the worth of something before a sovereign. And so much like before a king, you would say your excellency and take a knee. In the same way, to be a blessing to God is to declare the beauty and the majesty and the incredible things that you've seen him done and just give testimony to that. It shapes something fresh in us of gratitude and wonder when these things are coming off of our lips. 
the psalmist says, bless the Lord, O my soul, time and time again. Uh, when we look at Jesus' life, the response people had to Jesus that led to discipleship is that they were grateful and they declared and said, uh, they, gave, they were amazed, they give credit, they give honor, they give glory, they can't believe what they've seen. They're amazed and they praise God. Uh, there's time and time again that when you look at this, uh, people's response is one of amazement and praise. Uh, you see what God's up to in history or in your life, and you respond by saying, that's amazing. That's incredible. Does that mean that there's not hard moments? No. I encourage you to journey through those as well. But be sure that you get to the other ones. Split a piece of paper in half. And on the bottom, write all those hard moments. Uh, moving to Phoenix might be a hard moment. Uh, going and going through a death of a family member, hard moment. A friendship disintegrating, super hard moment. Uh, having an unexpected bill that puts you into debt that you weren't ready for, really hard moment. Write those down. The resurfacing of a wound that you thought was healed and all of a sudden it sidelined you for a long time. Hard moment. Write those down on the bottom half of the sheet of paper. But then on the top half, write all the ways that you've seen God be faithful in that same year. And it has this effect for us where we're blessing God and honoring him, not just trying to get ourselves into an emotional space, but just being aware of what he has done declaring his excellency. That's why we sing songs on Sundays. It's not just because that's the church thing to do. The reason God's people have always sung, and they've done it from the time uh, way back when, Old Testament style, is because it's a way to bless God and declare who he is to one another, to remind our weary souls. Uh, the second, listen. And I just jotted the words down there of curiosity and attention. To spend time listening to the words of Jesus. Uh, he says time and time again as you're reading the Gospels, if anyone has ears, let them listen. Or he'll say, listen, listen, I'm about to tell you something. Or if you open up your Bible and you see all those red letters, that was Jesus talking and there was somebody that was supposed to be listening. This was a heavy rhythm in the life of the apprentices of Jesus, was to be able to listen to the words of Jesus. And it's a lost art for us today. Uh, we have a high bias towards talking and a low threshold for listening. But again, if we wanna be resilient disciples who last in a myriad of hard circumstances, to be able to slow down and listen is so important. I was talking to a friend today, uh, and I was in their kitchen. We were having breakfast, and uh, sometimes we can be really good at li asking questions and not listening to the answers. And so uh, twice in a row, she asked me how I liked eggs, like because her husband was cooking eggs, and she asked twice, like, how do you like your eggs? I answered her just, like, any way you cook them is fine. She went to the kitchen, and she went to the, she came back out of the fridge, sets the orange juice down, and she goes, how do you like your eggs? And I, like, look at her husband, and I was like, any way you cook them is fine, like I just, it, just as long as they're not raw. And then one of the roommates said, that's very unrocky of you. And I said, thank you very much. Uh, and so it was a little thing. And so there's a story around it. And she goes back to the fridge to grab the butter, puts it on the table and comes back. She's like, how do you like your eggs? And I was like, what is this, like Dory? Is this like a test? Like what's going on here? And uh, her husband goes, he's answered that the last two times you asked him. And she goes, oh, I'm an ADH brain. I, never, I don't even remember like asking the question. Happens to me all the time. I ask a question, forget to listen, and I go on to the next thing. I ask a question, forget to listen, and go on to the next thing. And I was like, man, that is such a beautiful picture of how often I pray. I'll go to Jesus, I'll ask him a question, and then I'll walk away, right? And then I, they're like, oh, yeah, I wanted to know that. Jesus, hey, let's talk about that, right? And then immediately something else, and I walk away without ever listening to him, whether it's from the words of Scripture or it's giving him enough time to respond in that moment. Uh, thankfully, Jesus is much more gracious and doesn't laugh at us like I did to my friend. Uh, he welcomes us back every time with wide open arms. But that reminder to slow down and spend time and listen, uh, listening to the voice of God is one of the essential skills of any disciple of Jesus. And so if you'd say, like, I have no idea really how to do that, I would say, please don't put a pin in that one and come back to that in a few years. Like there are plenty of people in Missio who would love to walk with you through that. Uh, last year I sat at Pear Cupworks with a friend who's a pastor and he just said, hey Kevin, I gotta confess something. Bible college, seminary, pastoring a church. 
It's like, I have no idea how to listen to the voice of God. Like, I don't know how to tell if it's God talking to me or something, and I never have. And I've made it this far in it, but I don't wanna go the next 40 years in that same place. And I figured you're somebody who wouldn't laugh at me, which see, not everybody thinks I laugh at them. Um, I know, right? Loving, kind, gentle, all that present with them. Uh, but he's like, you're not somebody that's going to laugh at me, but you would actually walk with me in that. So you, can you teach me how to listen to the voice of God? Like something that he hadn't gotten in his early apprenticeship, in college, in graduate programs, and even in leading is a base skill that's accessible to every follower of Jesus. So will we carve out and curate the time to listen? A simple practice for this is just to set a 10-minute timer and that will seem like an eternity for some of us, all of us at the beginning. Set a 10-minute timer and then be silent in God's presence. And you're like, but my mind just races. Be like, cool, he can, he's there with you. And you'll develop, though, over time an ability to be present with Jesus in that space. And so you're like, 10 minutes is way too long. I'm going to dial it back to three. Great, Jesus will meet you there. But setting a timer for a longer period of time to be in God's presence and just not ask for anything, but make yourself aware that you're with him and ask him what he wants to say to you. The simple prayer from Samuel of, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. There is so much power in that. And we watch as the disciples in Jesus' day were able to get that, grasp that, and go forward, discerning the voice of the Spirit to see the church formed and flourish throughout the world. But it started with that simple skill. Everybody's favorite, eat. And so we used to say, uh, hey, eat, so like feast on God's word, which, great word play, also still a big fan of it. But even more than that, I I would encourage you that this table that we come around every single week is a weekly meal with Jesus that is powerful and should grow in how precious it is to us the longer that we follow Jesus. It's not just bread, juice, shot, gone, right? used to be that as a kid. We used to feel like we were drinking like tequila shots or something, right? And like tap the glass and shoot it. And that's like totally what they meant when they gave us communion. Um, It's not it at all. Uh, It might be your only carbs for the week if you're keto. And you're like, yes, I get really good bread for one taste. And that will become very precious to you. But even more than that, uh, this is representing the body and blood of Jesus. It's a weekly chance to re-inhabit the story of God. When Jesus gave that communion to them at first, it's while they were eating in Mark, Jesus took the bread and when he had given thanks, always give thanks, he breaks it and gives it to the disciples saying, take it, this is my body. And then he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank it. And he said, this is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly I tell you, I will not drink from it again until the fruit of the vine, until the day when I drink of it new in the kingdom of God. And then he passes it on to them and they pass it on to the next generation and the next generation and the next generation to the fact that we're here today inhabiting that same story as we take those same elements, remembering again the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. And there's nothing magical about this drape. You don't come up here and it's like David Blaine stuff happening. You know what I mean? It's not like there's something magical in the bread or the juice, but there is something extremely significant taking place. Uh, so much so that this is what Jesus wanted passed down. And so every week when you come to this table, it's a chance for another thin space where God's realm and our realm come together uh, to remember afresh and re-inhabit the story and have a weekly meal with Jesus where we're re-centered before we're re-sent out. And there's so much that's powerful in there. Again, um, the simple practice is to be present, to be able to receive the table alongside your sisters and brothers. So you can already check stuff off the list tonight. We're we're all about easy wins, um, and that's one of them. But maybe entering it into even a fresh way, as you approach the table, let your posture be one of gratitude. Let it be of curiosity. Let it be of wonder again at what this represents. Two more to go. Uh, This one, speak. Would you guys turn to two people around you? One, two. It's only two because I'm going to go quick. So you can do whatever one you want to. And Johanna will be in three because I know how you roll. It's all right. 
Um, but no, turn to one other person. Where do you see the power of Jesus speaking in the Gospels as you've read them so far? So in the story of Jesus, where do you see him speaking? Just have one location that you come to, and then I'll pull us back. So one time when you see Jesus, I already kind of gave you a big hint on that one. If you just open it, there's red letters. But turn towards each other. Uh, what comes to mind when you're like, man, there is really power in Jesus speaking. Ready? Turn towards each other. You got 30 seconds on the clock. Go. Three, two, one. The shot clock has expired. What was yours then? You could tell everybody. <laughs> I asked that question, one, because we recognize that there is power in the words of Jesus. He casts out demons. He turns bread, multiplies it out. He uh, raises dead people to life, right? He does all sorts of incredible things by the power of his word. Uh, and so sometimes and oftentimes that's what our mind goes to. Uh, I would offer up that some of the most powerful speaking he does all throughout the gospel are the moments that it intersects where it just says Jesus went and prayed. Uh, have you ever been curious, like, who did Jesus pray to? Like, he's Jesus, right? When I pray, I pray to Jesus. When he went off and prayed, though, he regularly had communion with the Father and with the Spirit. Everything he does is in communion and fellowship with the Father and with the Spirit. In John 14 through 17, you can read Jesus' picture of what he wants it to look like for his followers, to be able to experience joy, full, life-giving, flourishing, intimacy with Father, Son, and Spirit. Like, that's the picture of the flourishing life Jesus has for us. And I want to encourage us to remember to have that. And the words I put under there were just verbalize, conversation, and witness. Uh, each of those hits a slightly different dimension of, I think, how, again, we can build this practice into our life to be able to be resilient when it comes to our discipleship. To be able to, the first one, verbalize. I love that Jesus asked people questions because clearly in the gospel, he could also tell what they're thinking. Right? Like there's moments where it says like they're thinking this and then Jesus answers their thoughts. Like the story with the woman that comes in and wipes Jesus' feet with her tears, right? And the, the guy's thinking this and then Jesus answers his thoughts. Like that's within his realm of possibility. That's within his skill set apparently. But how often does he ask a question to people to allow them to verbalize and process where they're at. Because somehow in doing that, whether it's through spoken word or journaling or something like that, when we begin to get the thoughts out of our mind, something different takes place. Uh, Jesus has always done that. God did it with Adam and Eve in the garden. Where are you? Allowing them to come to, to him and be able to confess and process. And he still had words for them. But recognizing there's a power in us verbalizing where we're at, not just generally feeling it. And I would encourage you, simple practices, I don't do them all, but like journaling or sitting down with friends who ask a series of questions that center you again and allow you to process verbally. Uh, not, for the, not for the purpose of complaining or that sort of life. Like that's already, like we're not looking for gossip. That's not what it is. But as you process what's Jesus doing in your life to give verbal to that, right? Or to pray to God and verbalize, not just have a general feeling. I've learned a lot of people uh, don't put words to their prayers. They're just like, hey, I just feel this way around God, and that's just what we do, which is a cool thing to be in God's presence and be able to feel that you're present with him. But also when the, Jesus taught us to pray, he said, say this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. There's words to that that give shape to those thoughts. And I would just encourage us, be people who have those conversations with Jesus and each other around things that matter, to be able to be present in those and to give witness. If you want to see your faith continue to grow, continue to give witness to what Jesus is up to in your life. Verbalize to people who may not even agree with you what you watch Jesus doing in your life or your family or your neighborhood or your network. And it will again help to stabilize you when those winds come. And that the last practice right there is just the practice of Sabbath, of rest and worship. You'll recognize how often Jesus did stuff just to mess with the Pharisees on the Sabbath because they had missed the heart of it. But also he regularly took time for rest and worship. Uh, Eugene Peterson says it's a time for playing and praying. And so whichever one of those things resonate with you. And so, yes, we do that together. That's why we rest together. That's why we're here to receive from the Spirit together. Uh, but we also do that in our own time, to be in time that is not producing. 
And for those of you that stress out about that is not productive, that's not the point of it. But to have time that is not producing in your week to be in the presence of God. Where did Jesus tell me I had to do that? Like, it's knit into creation. It's also a massive gift. Like, the most time I get to spend, I want to. And undistracted time is always better than distracted time. And again, what you water will grow. If you want to be a person who is more at peace, stop being so frantic about producing. And so if you're like 24 hours, I know it says a day, that's way too long, I can't do that. Start with six and put your phone away for six hours and be present with the people you're with and something around you. Six is too many. Start with two, just start. And again, build that resilience. I was talking to a friend on, uh, what was it, Tuesday? And so... Um, he was running while we're talking. And so he used to get gassed, like out of breath, really, really easy, right? And so he's talking to me. He's like, all right, cool. All right, when are you calling? I told him when I'm calling, and I called him back, and I'm talking to him like I'm, you know, Jake, say hi. Now say hi like you just ran like a mile. Yeah, exactly, right? And so I call him, and he goes, that's what I would sound like. Um, and I was, I was like, what are you up to? And he's like, oh, I just slowed down my pace so I could talk to you. And I was like, What? Like, you're still running? Like, I thought you were going to stop running when we talked. He's like, no, I was just going to slow down my pace. Uh, I was going, you know, I was doing, it's my slower day anyway. So, but I slowed down from my eight-minute mile to my nine-minute mile. And I was like, say what? And so, like, we're having a conversation about life and things. And he's talking while he's running nine-minute miles, which for some of you, you might be in that kind of shape. I no longer am, right? And so I've realized that in running, that's not the pace that I do unless I'm like all out sprint somehow. I got slower, I'm slow. And so, but he's going nine minute miles. I like, what's your fast pace? And he's like, high sixes. And I was like, wait, so you're able to have like an actual conversation, not gasping in breath in my ear. Like, it's not like sounding like, you know, somebody's like giving birth on the other end of the phone. Like you're, ac he's like, yeah, last year I couldn't. Last year I was struggling to get 13 minute miles. And then I've run for the last year and now slowly build up that ability to do what I'm doing now. And so, and he was, had a full conversation for 30 minutes. And then he sent me his like time afterwards. And it was like three hours of running. Who does three hours of running at an eight minute pace? Like not me, maybe you, not me. But I would just say, like, with all of these practices, I know it's a lot. I know it's a ton. Uh, my last slide up there is just to take a deep breath and ask the question as if you were sitting with a, a beautiful cup of coffee and a blank page. Like, is there something out of all of those practices that maybe the Spirit would be leading you towards tonight? Like a curiosity or a fresh awareness that, hey, that is a rhythm of creation that God's woven in that I'm not participating in with him. And there's an invitation tonight to pick up a fresh one of those, to try it on, see how it feels. Don't start with the hardest trying to get six-minute miles. Start with your 16-minute walking pace if you have to. But by all means, start because there's a day when the opposite comes true. If you never engage with any of these things, atrophy sets in spiritually and in your soul in the same way it would physically if you never exercise. And so Jesus is always has arms wide open, always welcoming you back, always receptive and ready to shower grace on you. But all those moments that we waste in between when we're not following him actively, when we're living in a way that isn't towards health, when we're not responding to his grace, are all moments that we're not enjoying the full flourishing life that he has for us. And so as disciples, we want to experience that. As a pastor, I want our community to experience that. And as a follower of Jesus myself, that's what I want for my life. And all through the gospels, the hope was in doing this halfway through Mark. As you read the rest of Mark, hit Luke, hit John, that your eyes begin to take note of all these rhythms that Jesus weaves into his everyday life that aren't the things that he says, therefore go and do this, but it's how he does it as he goes that leads to super resilient disciples where 11 of those men who were following him all were willing to die to say, this is true and I stake my life on it. If we wanna have that kind of faith, it comes in the day-to-day -day build up. I so said, would we be faithful? Would you guys pray with me?